Welcome to Recovery Talk Live, an ongoing open discussion about psychological, emotional, and spiritual recovery. Our mission is to deliver the message that those who are suffering with emotional trauma can recover. And now, here are your hosts, Don and Terry. Welcome to Recovery Talk Radio, live from Orange County, California, with Don and Terry. And if you are joining us for the first time, we are so glad to have you. This is episode three of what we hope will be an ongoing lifetime series together, isn't it, Forever. Terry? Forever. Forever. Because recovery is forever. It's true. You're never done. It's true. We're never fixed. And at the end of our last show, we were talking about acceptance. We went from denial to acceptance. And mm-hmm. we kind of naturally just went into safe people and what that looks like. Because once you hit acceptance... If you're not with people who are safe, your journey is going to be toxic. Exactly. The, the, picking safe people in, is very uncomfortable for us because we don't know what they look like. We don't know what they smell like. Mm. Uh, what we do know is what unsafe people are like. Right. And changing isn't something that uh, most of us um, are excited about. Even though we say, oh, yeah, I want to change my life, I want to change my life. Um, then when it comes to changing the people that... Um, we're running with Hmm. isn't easy not easy especially Mm -hmm. when underneath if we've come out of situations that are unhealthy for myself uh, if i wasn't in chaos i could create it myself or find it yep because that was comfortable and familiar to me and we go with what we know yes which is usually if you're coming out toxic and unsafe if that's what you're familiar with and it's not conscious i don't think i consciously chose toxic people in my life but it was familiar and comfortable and I didn't know how to exist so when when we start people. down when we start a recovery process and we say okay I'm going to change the fact I don't do the things that I used to do I'm trying to move away from bad habits or whatever we want to call them in that situation how do you figure out what a good one is you well you have no marker when you're just coming out of it there's no marker there's no Well, I want to not say there's a book because Dr. Henry Cloud and Dr. John Townsend, love and love them, have written the book Safe People where they put some really good guidelines in there. But Mm -hmm. by nature, coming out of, you know, sexual addiction or shopping or alcohol or drugs, we don't know. And the thing is that the people that I know that we run with, that I ran with, want if they see you stepping out of your disease, they just want to pull you back in. And I have to say, and, uh, you know, I'm kind of embarrassed to admit this now, but this um, Townsend Cloud book, the first time I read it, I couldn't finish it because I realized in reading it, I was not a safe person myself. All the things, and this is pathetic and sad, but really all of, but not unindicative of the situation, but going through and looking at what I should be looking for in a safe person, all those traits, I had them, and I was an unsafe person, and I couldn't read it. You can see the edges are yellowed. I probably never picked it up again, and hopefully I don't fall in that category still, but... Uh, we we come out of our dysfunction not being safe ourselves. Well, you said something that I really I think is 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 huge. Um, I'm comfortable. Comfortable. I'm comfortable in chaos. I'm comfortable in 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 people not being okay. Right. I'm comfortable in disarray. I'm comfortable in in the things that are uh, what I know. And the problem with safe people is safe people aren't comfortable. Right. And for me, I have a high tolerance, had a high tolerance for unacceptable behavior. So, yeah, those normies just were too much for me. They're all screwed up. They really are a mess. So, and my journey um, in in my early recovery was people actually said no to me. Normies meaning people who are not in recovery, who just aren't addicted to anything. Yeah. Just so Normal people are people who can function normally. Yes. The ones we don't know. Colin, our producer, looks like one, doesn't he, (laughs) Terry? Although I think we're taking him with us on the ride here. Is he a little off? Okay. Well, then he So I think part of the process, though, is is the fact that that, uh, normal behavior isn't typically uh, something that's destructive. And we don't know what that looks like. Healthy behavior, because really, what's normal? There you go. Healthy behavior. Let's do that one. I would say healthy behavior. Okay, so healthy behavior. I grew up in a house where I was taught unhealthy behavior. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I didn't even know what healthy behavior looked like. Correct. If I went to your house, um, I knew that you were a show. I knew that you were pretending. I knew uh, that the things that were going on at your house, you just wait till the doors close, because that's what happened at my house. Hmm. And so the boundaries that we have, um, and that's something we can talk about later, but the boundaries that I had to run my life were pretty unhealthy, but I didn't know it. Now, see, interesting, you said growing up in your house that it was unsafe. The situation was unsafe. Mm -hmm. However, for me, and you know that I'm a speaker, 
my platform when I speak in the sole purpose, I go out and tell the dirty little details of my testimony and can say that I was an unsafe person myself is because I believe and I think it's true of my family and most likely of yours that these are these destructive family patterns are passed on generation to generation. So for me, my like you're doing those awesome things, you know, with the trafficking. Mm -hmm. I mean, my life mission is to break dysfunctional family patterns so our kids can have a better life to follow. So most likely, the stuff that happened in your family of origin and mine, it probably happened to our parents, too. And they were, I think there's a high likelihood, and they were just mimicking what they saw, and nobody stops, steps out of the insanity to break the cycle. Um, not probably at my house. On both sides well, of my family. I can't family. speak to, your, well, I can. to you. I can only I can. speak to myself. So. My family on both sides um, were extremely um, disruptive, dysfunctional. On my dad's side, it was all alcohol. On my, mm -hmm. on my mother's side, it was all alcohol. Um, so I grew up in a house that um, it, that really represented, I think you're right, is, is a continuation it's, of family behaviors. And the sins of the, of the father can go four generations deep um, is a pretty scary thought that it gets passed on and gets passed on and gets passed on because we don't know how to get out of it. But we, I believe we have a responsibility to break it. And, and one thing we haven't shared with our listeners, and you and I are both followers of Christ. Mm -hmm. um, that's our God. We aren't, uh, don't have, you know, a candle on the mantle that we're making our God. We are believing in a higher power living God. So we're open about that. In this journey and also I think uh, just as we bring in new listeners I want to further explain that sometimes you'll hear me correct myself a lot because in recovery we use I statements instead of you statements because a you statement assumes everybody had the same experience so um, I use a lot of self-correct in that to not uh, try to fix the world and my Perfect. codependent well, that's good. self so there's hope for you there's hope for me but okay. that's that's my life mission I think if you're 90 with a 70 year old it's not too late to break the well, patterns. my sobriety happened when and I was 45 it. years old. Wow. So, you know, I don't think it was ever too late. And yet my clients, um, I, you know, I have 21-year-old kids and 20-year-old kids. That are, How old are your kids when you uh, I have I have two. I have a 27-year-old daughter with my second marriage. And no, no, when you, were, when you were 45, when you started oh, getting sorry. healthy. How old were your kids? My daughter that, that with my, this, my, um, my current wife uh, was five and a half. Mm-hmm. And my other daughter would have been 16. Yeah. 16. So because you chose to step out of the dance of dysfunction and become a safe person and learn what that is, and we'll talk about that more, how has that changed? How are your kids now, and how would they have been had you not made that choice? Well, I have no idea how they would have been. Oh, you can speculate. Uh, they'd probably if they didn't a, have a sober dad, come on, let's just say it. Well, They'd be the, drunk the chances themselves. Are, the chances are they would not have done well by That's now. right. But um, the, the difference today is that, that I am um, uh, sober. Right. And um, being a safe person for them um, was not something that I woke up one morning at the age of 45 and three days and was safe. I had to learn how to be a safe person. Uh, one of the things that being a safe person is learning to say yes when you mean yes and no when you mean no. And uh, that was something that wasn't easy for me in the beginning because um, I wanted to say yes to almost anything and no to almost nothing. Uh, if it was fun, if it got me where I wanted to go, if I was going to go get loaded or go get high or go get drunk or whatever it was. So learning self-discipline um, and having to pass that on to people around me uh, was, was a very interesting journey because the people that I found out were safe were the people that said no. Now, let's, we have to go just for our audience. I went to our dictionary.com friends because uh -oh. we like to use them, and hopefully they should be promoting us at this point because we pra practically live, eat, and breathe them. We can always switch to Webster's. If they don't, I'm just saying. So their second definition of safe, because Webster's, we know you're out there, man, and you were the original, and I will open the big book. Here I have it right here, and I don't mean the AA book. Webster's is waiting. Anyway, that's my shout-out to dictionary.com. Okay, I like definition number two, Terry, free from injury or risk. Safe people are free from injury or risk. Those are not the people we grew up with, and they are dependable. And that's who we want to become, and that's who we want to associate with. And when we are in our disease, we are not hanging with those people. That's a fact. That's a fact. That's so a how fact. do we get out of those dance? Um, I think Season part of sickness. it is to recognize, um, which is not easy. And that's why having um, 
the groups, having the people, and not uh, not just going to meetings, having safe people uh, around are people that I can trust. Because birds of a feather flock together. Yes. You said it earlier. When I tried to get out of alcohol, uh, they tried to pull me back. Pull you in. And so today, um, I just don't run around with people that do those kinds of things. That's number one safe for me. But in my early recovery, um, saying no to myself um, wasn't easy. So I had a sponsor. I worked a program. I did the things that, that helped me build the boundaries, right. and helped, helped me put in some safeguards um, so that I could say Boundaries. No. We haven't talked about yet. So we're we gonna, have to be careful with our show. lingo and scare people show. off. We'll just might as well speak Mandarin. We have to be careful. Yes. Um, you know, we have to use recovery ease here. We have to, you know, not well, scare people. It's part of the, with it's our part of the educational program. Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> educational programming so from Don and program. Terry and so, Colin on the side. Okay. So the process, though, I think is, is safe people aren't always comfortable. No. And unfamiliar, they're unfamiliar to us. So when somebody, we don't even like them. Let's just admit it. When well, we in the first start think, off, yes, when absolutely. we first start off. So I think that's the point that that, that is is something that that people in the early journeys here will go. Uh, you know, I don't like them because they tell me things I don't want to hear. It's probably people who are safer. And having having somebody who cares enough about me to tell me no is um, kind of a scary thing. It is. Um, is it backing uh, back one of the things that that Bob used to ask me. Um, now he's Bobby last Bob, time he was Bob should, Bob's beating up Bob the sponsor see I have to ask my sponsor for yeah. permission to use her name before I throw oh, her out there so he doesn't get about okay. oh Bob poor Bob when he died yeah. he oh, never knew so Bob, okay. Bob, but Bob asked me a question that, that I, I still carry with me and I think it's one of the best questions that I ever heard from anybody for any reason he said what's a friend to you hmm Person who poured you a drink, and that's it. Now I hear and you. So I'd say, well, Falling yeah, that's somebody who would take care of me and run, and get my stuff, and that's do a lot right. of the junk. And so, somebody who 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 I said was a friend, I never put in there with somebody who would tell me no. Hmm. That wasn't. That was so foreign to me. It is. That somebody would say, no, that's not good for you, and uncomfortable, and you don't like it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you know. So that whole process of. of of him saying to me, a good friend is somebody who cares enough about you to say no. And it's like, wow. That's that's the definition of a new friend, but those weren't your old friends. For me, uh, I didn't have friends. You didn't have friends. I there's a there's a concept uh, that I really ran into. Oh dear, do I need to look up friends at dictionary.com? You probably do. Maybe Webster's if we don't hear from Pay them attention. soon. Okay. okay. But one of the things that I found was very interesting is that. Uh, I found out in, in looking at what a friend was for me yes. and my old friends, if I had a buck, if I had a bottle, or if I had a bag, I was somebody's best friend. But if I didn't have a buck, if I didn't have any money, if I didn't have a bottle, or if I didn't have a bag of something, I didn't have a lot of friends. I don't want to know what was in your bag. Uh, stuff. Okay, you don't need to share that. Okay, so, thank you. All right, so yeah. the process is, in, is really kind of one that I had to redefine what a friend was for me, and I think um, I think that after the break we can we can kind of dig into that some more and talk a little bit more about the uh, about boundaries and, and safe relationships and, and friendships. Yeah, yeah. And uh, now you're making me evaluate what were and what I thought mine were. But we will be back after a quick break from our soon to be hopeful sponsors at MaybeDictionary.com. You're live with Don and Terry in Orange County, California. You're watching Recovery Talk Live. If you would like to contact Don and Terry, please send your email to recoverytalklive at gmail.com. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or insight, we'd love to hear from you. Again, send your email to recoverytalklive at gmail.com. And here's a quick preview of one of our all-video live-action episodes. Well, I can bring you women who would say their verbal abuse was worse than their physical. I know. Well, when, I ta when I taught classes, the number one reason that men were in the program mm -hmm. was not physical abuse. The number one reason was emotional and verbal abuse. That the men per perpetrated on women or that was perpetrated on the men? Yes. Yes to both? Mm hmm Okay. Now, here's the problem with that, is that you had two people who did not have any boundaries at all. But safety is always first. Okay, but safety for the for the wife or for the woman and yes. the children, to me, 
is number one. Okay, now we can be friends. Okay. All well, right. That's important. Because that's it. Okay. I don't. I mean, there's a whole number one. You know. Okay, number one. Slew of things. But that doesn't that doesn't take responsibility away from either party. You're watching the last of the slideshow format episodes, and all further episodes of Recovery Talk Live will be in the live action format. So join us to see Don and Terry in all their live action glory, and stay with us on Recovery Talk Live. Welcome back to Recovery Talk Live with Don and Terry and our very cool producer, Colin, who has very slicked back there. We are your new friends, your safe friends here at Recovery Talk. Okay, Terry, I looked up friend uh, at our favorite little dictionary.com website, a person attached to another by affection or regard. Totally don't buy it. We could have an affection for the same disease or abuse. I don't like it. So I think we have to combine it with the definition of safe, a person attached to another by affection or regard. Offering security from danger and dependable. That's just not a good de definition of friend. Attached to somebody because of affection or regard. I can have an affection for you because we're doing something, robbing a bank together. That's, not, that's your criminal friend, not a safe friend. We'll read the whole thing again. Okay, the definition of friend. A person attached to another by affection or regard. Okay, so if I regard you... As a criminal because we're bank robbers. You can okay. be my bank robbing friend. I don't like the definition. Okay, so for you, both of them, if you put safe people together, you get one that works for you. Yes, yes, because a friend also offering security from danger, dependable, like you said, speaks the truth and love. You know, my friends, when I was an active chaotic codependent, were the ones who, you know, bought into chaos and created drama with me that I didn't need. We were both sick and we fed each other. So those weren't safe friends. I okay. was not a safe friend. All right, so safe people for you are people who care about your health and well-being. Yeah, and speak the truth in love and it's reciprocated. And also, a safe friendship is one that's equal in sharing. If I'm sharing my stuff with you, my needs, my hurts, things I need to be accountable for, but you have a wall up and you're not telling me your stuff, then you're not necessarily safe. It has to be two-sided. I'm not going to go deep with you if you're not going to go deep with me. That's a different level of friendship. It's more of a superficial thing. Not necessarily unsafe, but not equal. Well, then you're talking about different layers of, of, of relationships then. Yes, but we have, to, we have to give our listeners the safe friend definition. So okay. they're not out there spiraling. In okay, so a safe friend is somebody who, who's somebody that you can trust, believe in, supports you. Um, looks out for your general health and well-being, uh, doesn't intentionally hurt you, on a, and and um, and wants what's best for the relationship. Right. So Is that let's, close? Yes, but in I know in my sickness I can see a I have seen unsafe people in my history as being safe because I think they're doing those things. Maybe we should look at the definition of an unsafe person. What are those things? Like when we talked about denial, what are those things, the marker, where we can say, okay, I'm in denial. We need to address the markers for our audience of what an unsafe person is, those red flags that should be going off. You know, I was at a justice conference, um, and the DA was speaking last year, and she said in her talk um, here in Orange County, she said, we are the only animal on the face of the earth. God designed us to trust our gut. That, ignore, that trains itself to ignore our gut instincts. And she was in reference to... Um, you know, people who have been molested, sexually abused, put themselves in, not that it's their fault, but people who put themselves in unsafe situations and go, well, it's Uncle, you know, Harold, and he, he doesn't feel good when he hugs me, but, you know, he's my relative, so I'll be with him. And then something horrible happens, and we train ourselves or allow people to tell us because somebody looks okay that it's okay when everything screaming in us is saying it's not okay. So one of the things that we are, if we're on the top of the food chain, are the only animal that will willfully and knowingly hurt itself? Train ourselves not to, to ignore, you know, what I know is the Holy Spirit, that gut feeling that something's wrong. Because we know them, we're related to them, they have a good reputation, they look nice, and we put ourselves so, in an unsafe so situation. So using that definition then, then how do you define unsafe people? Unsafe people are not supporting me on my journey to wellness. I was looking in here... Uh, in the Cloud and Townsend book, Safe People, they have the who are the bad guys. And they actually label it, you know, by different characteristics. There's the character discernment, you know, and um, giving us cues. There's the abandoner, the critic, 
you know, the, di the different types of people in our lives that... Uh, so people, people then using the definition, then we've got, if you use the critic, that's somebody who's always telling me that I'm, I should do it differently. Well, it says unsafe people are defensive instead of open to feedback, too. So they might oh, be telling you what okay. to do, but be unwilling to receive the okay. truth and love from you. Interesting, interesting point. They're self-righteous instead of humble, the unsafe people. They avoid working on their problems instead of dealing with them. They look at yours. That That's sounds the like log in your eye and the speck in the other's eye. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, I know that for me in my journey, um, the unsafe people were the ones who were willing to hurt me. Right. They were the ones who were willing to help me um, ride in chauffeured limousines, ones with flashing lights on top, mm. which uh, was kind of fun because then I got to go to a building where people really cared about me and they paid a lot of attention to me. And they gave me a private room with a lock on it. Okay, is there and some, so, you know, some weird parallel here I should be drawing from? We call from? that jail. Oh, okay. All right. I thought you were using some, you know, like I got so high they no, gave me a limo to gamble for free. Car, okay. And, and I was right. able to. Not uh, reading the analogy. Yeah. Okay. And it's very interesting because. Uh, you got arrested at some point. Oh, yeah. What did you do, you bad boy? Um, I didn't know this about you. You didn't know that, maybe? No, do you have an ankle oh, bracelet on right now? No, no, okay, no. I'm, I'm pretty good. No, I, I was able to. Um, um, drunk in public was my. Was my mm. best, best okay. uh, show. Didn't know that. I was New actually info. pretty good about it. Yeah, um, I'm. Uh, there's things. There's things you don't know. Okay. Um, but the the opportunity to to be around people because it, the interesting thing is when when the cops showed up, everybody disappeared and I got caught. Wow, and your so, friends. Yeah, my your friends. friends. My friends disappeared. Ran. Yeah. And unfortunately, I didn't ran fast enough. Hmm. Uh, in fact, I fell down. Um, so I was pretty easy to catch. But my friends were long gone. And do you know how my friends helped me with bail? They didn't. They didn't. And my friends Did they didn't show up to the judge when um. sentencing came and say, you know, Your Honor, that was us too. They didn't show up. But the crazy part was when I got out. You went back to them. And, you know, mm -hmm. they said, come on, let's go get drunk. Let's celebrate. And I thought... That's a good idea. Predictable behavior, though, when we're doing Don't the unsafe think? friend dance. Don't yeah, the think? little polka of unsafe friends, and we just jump so, back in. So I think a lot of this is, is recognizing that the people that are safe for me are the people who are willing to say no to behavior that's, that's detrimental. They're willing to say, hey, can I walk alongside you? Uh, they're willing to invest in us right. uh, versus taking from us. And I think they, the, the concept of safe people really um, is something that in many ways is foreign because we're used to the other style. We're used to being around people who are unsafe for us and really don't know how to get out of that right now. It, it's interesting because for me, and not unpredictable that you went back to those people, I mean, as we all do in our disease, we, we return to the familiar, comfortable, even though we don't like it situation. And... Um, for me now, when I'm looking to find safe people, it's funny, the things that I can see, that I can recognize someone's not safe is if they're behaving in a way I did before I was safe. Uh -huh. Before I was safe. And I had this experience um, a couple of months ago with a lady, and I saw her. There was an accident. Something happened. She went to get involved, and I was watching this dynamic of this person when there was an automobile accident. And she was commanding the attention to be about her when she wasn't even in the accident. And that's just a need for attention. I used to do that myself. Gossip. Gossip was a big thing where I came from. Um, in my 20s, huge gossip. You know, somebody leave the room, yada, 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 just to get attention. It was attention-seeking behavior. I did it to fit in. Awful. Toxic. The Bible talks about it. So now when I see that, red lights, red lights, that's not a safe situation, and I remove myself. So I actually use my old past unsafe behaviors to help identify unsafe people myself. Hard to admit that, but true. Well, but don't you think that that's, that's wisdom on your part? It's growth. It's growth. I mean, it's not pretty to admit that I was not a nice person like that, you know, that I gossiped about people and, you know, spread harmful things around just to be in the know for self-seeking mm -hmm. attention. That's what it was. Yeah, but... I'm still going to try and give you some credit here, whether you all take it or right, not. Do you right. think the possibility exists that that's called wisdom? Because we're learning how to do it differently. We're making yes. a different choice. 
And I don't know about you, but I sure haven't forgotten how to be stupid. No, no, no. That's easily conducted. Okay. Slip right back in there, yeah. So the fact that you're, you're, you're aware of and you're looking at things and saying, hey, that behavior is not okay for me. Right. Uh, yes, it's still available to us. You know, one of the things that's kind of interesting about our, our brain is that we never unlearn anything. Hmm. And I don't know about you, but I've been on roller skates for a very long time. But it doesn't mean, you know, you, you might still know how to rob the bank, but it doesn't mean you're going to go back and rob it. Exactly. So we can still know what it looks like to be unsafe. It doesn't so, mean we're going to be things, unsafe. Those are things that I've learned. I don't do that. Uh, I've been skiing for 30, how old am I? I've been skiing for 36 years. And we went skiing um, in Tahoe this past February. And one of the things that was interesting is I put on my ski boots and my feet went, what are you doing? Mm. And it's like, you haven't been on these for a while, so I had to get used to them. Okay. And then I got on my skis, and I went sliding around, and my body had to get used to it. Even though I've done it for years, the old patterns of being lazy and not working on stuff and things, they were all still there. And so in my, in my process of getting back on my skis, if you will, right. um, you know, I, I got on the chairlift without falling off, which like was Like riding the bike. Yeah. That came back so to you. So it all came back. But so, that's a positive behavior. That's a positive behavior, but that also says that I don't forget anything. That's I can true. get on the old horse. I can do the old things. I didn't forget those. Hence the backslide. It can happen in a moment. Backslide in recovery, meaning we re go back and fall off the wagon, we drink, we get into codependency, yeah. we shop, and sex addicts go back to porn, whatever it is. So I think if, if, we can, if we can understand that none of this goes away, we just have to make a better choice. We have to be a little wiser. We have to choose better. Um, and it's kind of, or kind of skating around the edges of boundaries, which I think is a whole other program. I think it's us. a whole show. Yeah. I think we can but do a whole thing, show. But the thing that I like about safe people is there's two things that I, that I feel very, very um, blessed by in many ways, is that safe people give grace. They do. And I think that's huge. And safe people tell the truth. But they don't enable, and there's a line. They give you grace, but they don't enable. Um, I, I think that's, that's, for you, that's a really big point. Big I think point. I think it's huge. Um, but grace says, I care about you. I will step into you. I will tell you no. But I do it because I care about you, and I want what's, what's best. And that takes risk, and that's, that's um, in many ways, that's pretty scary for the, for the person that's doing it and for us. Right. And I think the other thing is that people who really care about us will tell us the truth. They won't tell us what we think we want to hear. They will tell us in many ways things that we don't want to hear. One of my markers for safe people is if I'm meeting a new person and they have a behavior that I don't like about myself and they're actively in it, then I know they're not safe. Because I know I can be drawn to that because mm -hmm. it's familiar. Like let's just say gossip. If there's a group of people gossiping, I know, you know, I could be drawn to that. That's something I could backslide in. I haven't. That's something that's just, it's just not a, a place I'll go, but there's other temptations in, other, in so, other areas. So then let's take one more step here. Then being a safe person would, would have to include saying no to yourself. Oh, yeah. We can, I guess we can be very unsafe to ourselves. But, boy, that's, you talked about self-discipline. There's no self-discipline without God because on my own, powerless. God intervening. Okay, so that's kind of like came to believe that a power greater than myself could return me to sanity. Sanity, that's right. Because that's if I'm coming back to sanity, where have I been spending time? Insanity, which the definition is. Go ahead. Continuing a behavior, expecting a different result. Doing it over and over and expecting over the results. Over and over to and over and over. Say that for our new non recovery <laughs> friends who now realize they're completely messed up like us. They get what we're saying and they want to be in our very cool sick people getting well club. That's what this really is. You know, as Colin sits over there, our producer, I think he's sicker. He looks so good, but there's some sickness in there somewhere. He'll join our club soon. We'll have him in a group. We'll put him in a circle. We're Hi, my name's Colin. Sign <laughs> he's signing up. Yeah, he gets it. And that's really the point of why we're doing this and, and why you and I are willing to share our stuff is to help other people out there who haven't identified it to not go down the slippery slope. Do you well, agree? I think that's, I think that's, that's part of it. But I think the bigger piece is that, for me, is that, Number one, um, I'm not alone. Not alone. Uh, number two, uh, and I mean this is exactly the way it sounds, if I can make it, anybody can make it. Yeah. Because we're not alone. Uh, we have a power greater than ourselves that does want better things for us. And so part of that is we're, I'm powerless. Powerless, it's and true. And so um, if, I can, if, if, 
if that is something that I can that I can get comfortable with, then I have a God who cares about me and wants what's best, and then I'll be around people who care about me, safe people, and I'll be uh, be in a place where I can grow and in a healthy way, in a safe way. And I hear you, and I share my story, and people often say it's so detailed, especially not my luncheon talks when I'm speaking of luncheon, but mm. my recovery talks so deep. If I can save one person from jumping off that roof, wanting to take their own life, giving up, because I can share what God did in my life with it, totally worth it, every bit of it. You turn into, you know, it's, it's a victor, not a victim situation. Well, I think that's a really, I think it's a, that's an important message I think that people need to hear is that they are cared about, they do matter, they're significant, and that uh, there's a God who's, um, who's bigger than all of this. And so I think um, learning, to, learning to, put, um, to put some boundaries up in this thing, I think that's, that should it's be time. a really good inter- introduction to our next show. Next time on Recovery Talk. Mm-hmm. With Donna Terry live in Orange County, California. We're sick, but you're sicker. Join us next time and learn how to set up boundaries. Have a great day. You've been watching Recovery Talk Live. If you have questions, comments, concerns, or insight, we'd love to hear from you. Send your email to recoverytalklive at gmail.com. That's recoverytalklive at gmail.com. Look for new episodes every week and thanks for watching Recovery Talk Live.